A few of you. Who enjoyed Cash Buddy? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. Who ran through all the steps I'm going to talk about when you were going through it? You don't know yet. If you answered yes, you're lying because no one's seen these slides before. All right, so I'm Jake Drehaus, and I'm going to be doing a nice teardown on a web application. So to start that off, first thing we'll walk through is basically what is a web application and what makes it tick? Uh, there's a lot of different frameworks out there, a ton of different ways to do it, but there's a lot of components in common across all frameworks, across all web applications. They all really work a lot in the same way. Some of them work really stupid ways, but it's all sort of the same idea. So how a web app works. They handle requests. You type in a URL, it gives you a web page. You click a link, it gives you another web page. That's how the internet works. I hope we're all kind of familiar with that process. So your application receives a request, and then it does what's called routing the request, which basically is what does this request need to do? It could be a static request where you're just getting a file. This is how you get your images, your JavaScript, your CSS. They call them assets sometime. Or it could just be a static HTML file. That's nothing special. We've been able to do that since the mid-90s. Then there's the other ones where it's actually something cool. Hopefully if you're doing a web application, you're doing something dynamic, even if it's just as simple as getting the time of day to put it in your web page. That requires you to run some code. Some code runs. Might access a database. Tons of web apps use a database on the back end for a couple reasons I'll get into later. And we render some sort of template. We don't want to do a whole bunch of code to like write a bunch of HTML and a print statement or something weird like that. We're just going to have a nice template with all of our HTML ready to go, fix a couple of things, and ship it off. So that's what our web app does. There's a couple of components. There's a router, which can be sort of separated. It can be a configuration file, an XML file, maybe a little bit of code in a special place that configures how things route. What code do we run for what URLs people are trying to access? Then there's the model view controller, that's a MVC design, which uses models, which are things. If you think about your object-oriented programming, think of a model as a class. Views are your templates, and then controllers are sort of the glue code that connects everything together, picks out your model, tweaks some values, updates your model, renders a view. Then there's almost always a database component of web applications because this can be some sort of persistent data where you'll need to go back, change something, and then get it later. All right, MVC. You're going to hear this all over because it is all the rage, has been all the rage for the last 10 years in web app development. Nifty little diagram there from Wikipedia that basically outlines your models, your views, and your controllers. You hit a controller. It then manipulates models, fetches them, updates them, creates them, destroys them, and then your model is then displayed by a view back to the user. And this seems rather restricted, but it is really flexible. It's a lot more flexible than it sounds, because you think of a lot of things in terms of models and uh, views. For example, a, a login and log out. Think, well, how is that object oriented in a way of saying, well, let's treat your session as a model. Your session is a thing. Then when we log in, we create a session with a controller for creating a session. Then when we log out, we destroy that session with a controller that destroys sessions. And there we've sort of taken the uh, kind of complicated idea of are you logged in or not and turned it into a thing, a model, that we can then manipulate with these controllers. <coughs> Routing. A couple of different things up there, a couple of different languages. We might play spot the programming language there if we want. Uh, it can be sort of integrated, uh, inline, or separate. Uh, some of the big frameworks, uh, Django, Rails, all your Java stuff, they do it sort of separate in a separate configuration file, uh, like I mentioned earlier. And as those two off to the top to the right, up there we've got a, a Django URLs.py file, and you can see how it's sort of mapping URL patterns, that's on the left half there, like that dashboard slash check in, to code that runs. It's mapping the URL, the path, to the function that runs. Middle right there is a Rails routes.rb, same thing, mapping a URL to a function or a method, or pick the word in the language of your choice. That's the code that runs when that URL is hit. 
Then down below, there's Sinatra on the left. It's also in Ruby. And then Flask on the right, where they sort of do it in line. You, you take your route, and you put it right there where you have your code. So that it's, here's the code, and here's what makes it run. That's the idea there. Models are, like I said before, it's like, think of it as a class. It's a class plus a database. It, it's really easy to think of. You'll, you might hear the word CRUD. It's a create, read, update, destroy application, where you simply have records or things that you can manipulate. It's sort of the most simple web app you can imagine, where you've just got, you know, say, users, that you can create a user, you can change things about the user, you can get things about the user, and then you can delete a user when you're sick of them. Same thing with posts. We can think of Twitter as a CRUD application. There's users, there's tweets. And you can create, read, update, and destroy users and tweets. And then users own tweets, throw a couple layers of complexity in there and you see why they're worth a couple billion dollars. But it's still at a simple level just a way of creating, reading, updating, and destroying information in the database. And a model is almost always backed by a database. So if you're not familiar with the database, is this? Is anyone not familiar? If I said database, are you like trying to know what that is? Everyone absolutely knows what a database is then, right? Can't not raise your hand here. You have, you have no choices. Kind of know what a database is. So the reason we use a database is it's persistent. If we're just using variables in our programming language, if we reboot the web server, that all goes away. We're not losing every single tweet when Twitter needs to reboot a web server. Now they've got like hundreds, maybe even thousands of web servers running. But it's all a single database that stores your data, it stores your information separate from the web server. It also gives you some really good performance benefits because the database is running its own process, it's its own software, it's very heavily optimized, especially if you've got good database engineers behind designing it. And then that's where all your data goes to your database. And if we pat back a bit, you think of it this way, if we put the models and the database, you can see that what's viewing things and what's manipulating things is separate from what's actually storing your data. That's just some nice architectural design to have as well. Let's see, is this... Okay, next slide. So how do you do a model? You can sort of fake it out by hand. You know, we don't want to be writing in the middle of our controller, doing some logic, and then clobbering together some database stuff and doing that. We want to have sort of an idea of what our things can do. So you can have some functions, you know, create user, set username, get username, you can have a million functions for the different things we might want to know. But that's a lot of work, and you can sort of screw it up. So a big thing lately, a big sort of design idea is this idea of an ORM, an object relational mapping, which is a really fancy term for a magic class that is like automatically backed by a database. So there's an example of, a, of one in Flask, actually. Flask doesn't have an ORM built in. That's some Python ORM. But that class user has a username, a balance, and a password. Seems pretty reasonable. And it's a Python object. Like any other Python object, Python class that you want to do, you've just got users, you can create them, you can manipulate them. But whenever you change it, well, when you're done with it, it saves it to the database, where it's then stored. So you can have a different copy of the application running, and it can still get at the same users, because they're stored in that database. And the ORM takes care of that automatically for you. Um, it sort of abstracts away all that database. You don't need to write SQL. So if you hate writing SQL, Someone hate writing SQL? You hate writing SQL. Everyone out here hates writing SQL. You kind of hate writing SQL. No RM, you never have to write SQL. Because you just create your objects in Python, in Java, in Ruby. You have your objects. And they're just magically backed by the database. Whenever you change your objects, they get saved to the database. Whenever you want to get something from the database, it just spits it out as an object for you. And this eliminates SQL injection because someone way smarter than you designed the ORM and they didn't screw it up, hopefully. So you don't have to worry about doing it right. You don't have to worry about letting SQL injection happen and ruining your day because you're not writing any SQL. Views, pretty simple. I'm going to skim over this real quick, but it's basically as a template. And there's more templates available than like even frameworks. Like each framework supports like eight different templating systems and 
everyone's a little different, but the basic workflow is still the same. Your controller runs some code, it sets a couple of variables, and then it calls your template. Your template runs, it doesn't really do very much, but sticks those variables into the HTML and ships the HTML off to your user. So in that way, your user's like, I want to get a list of all the products you have for sale. Your controller runs, grabs the product model, sets a couple of variables, kicks it off to the view. The view's like, oh, we've got, we've got 80 products, there's a for loop, here's a couple of product names, and then ships it off. And all the rest of your HTML is basically plain old HTML that any old web developer can write for you. It has a lot of features turned on normally, it makes XSS not happen. A couple of injection vulnerabilities along the same lines are killed pretty easily, and it takes good care of you, unless you turn it off. Which, people turn it off, and then they get boned. It's hilarious. We'll see that one with Cash Buddy. Then controllers. Controllers are where the meat of your application happens, because the controllers are really the actual code. I say yeah, they're sort of glue code or business logic, but a lot of times they do a lot more than just glue models to views. Your most simplest one, sure, it'll just, you know, see what models, might read a couple parameters, figure out what models your user wants to show, get some stuff, throw it in, throw it in a template, and then your view takes care of the rest of it, puts it all in a table, whatever. Well, they can be quite complex, especially if you've got non-database things going on. If you have like a messaging queue, or you're sending emails, or you're doing some of this weird stuff, maybe you're GitHub and you need to right, compile someone's stuff automatically when they upload it, when they do a push, maybe you need to send some notification emails out, that all just happens in your controller, because your controller runs when someone gets to it. And the most important thing that your controllers do is they do access control. So if you have a delete user controller, should any old user on the website be able to run that controller? It'd be a really fun website if they could, right? but probably not something you want to do, especially if you have like any hopes of not getting destroyed in the CDC. So access control should for the most part be happening in controllers. Uh, you can sometimes do your access control actually at the router. So say if, if you're not logged in, you're not allowed to do these things. But for the most part they happen in controllers. I'll come back to those, uh, those. There's controllers actually, those bottom two examples of the routing because it's sort of inline routing with the controllers. The controllers are right there. You can actually see in that Ruby one on the left, return redirect to login unless logged in. That's access control happening right there in the controller. And then the controller really just renders a view at that point. So let's do a, a, a bit of a teardown on Cash Buddy from the CDC. This is my slide I told you about. I anticipated the issues. Anyone have any questions? Anyone need a couple seconds to develop any questions to ask while I sort of get this going? All yours. The quiz will be at uh, 10 till. <laughs> this is what I'm finding like my VM that I've got ready. It's just like not running for some reason. is a Flask application. Flask is what we call a micro framework, meaning it doesn't do very much for you, but it's good if you just want to build a quick and dirty small application because you can almost throw everything in a single file. All right, so we want to tear this application apart. I'm actually wearing my EEV blog shirt today, so if anyone watches that, you're, you're smiling. Want to say it with me? Don't turn it on, take it apart. Yeah, he's giving me the thumbs up. Y'all need to watch EEV blog. If you want to take apart electronics and complain about the guys in China that built it. Okay, so we'll start with our routes. 
uh, because now Flask is a micro framework and it sort of does that inline routing for the most part where your routes are glued right to your controllers all on one file, which is pretty nice and easy. So there's a route. This is the index route. So it's what you get when you just hit the root of the root of the application. This is another route for begin transaction, transaction, validate transaction, login, log out, register, account. That's interesting. Account slash page. That could be a thing. Post testimonial, test post bag, slash debug. That's a route. Interesting. So we're tearing down this application. We can build a list and we got some pen and paper of what routes we want to take a look at. Because now we know what URLs we can type in that make it do things. So let's do a thing. Web browser here. Helps to run the application first. So this cache buddy, you're all probably familiar and or traumatized by that uh, that image there. So that slash debug route looks interesting. And we found that because we found the list of all the URLs that do things. So is it F4? F6. 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 something like Django or Rails where all of your routes are in one file just to see what happens. If there's a route called like vendor backdoor, that's probably something you should look at because that doesn't sound too healthy. We've also got one of the other things I mentioned, models. Probably models.py. So here's where we've got all those ORM models I mentioned earlier. So we've got a user, has a username and balance passwords. A session, like I mentioned earlier, you can treat your sessions as a model. Save them, update them, destroy them to log someone and log someone out. Card, like a credit card, belongs to a user. So that's how easy it is to do your uh, has many, has one relationships with an ORM. You can just do foreign key like that. And then comments, it's really just a, just a text field. Catchphrase, also just text field. Don't really know where those come into play, but we can find out. Those are the models. Let's take a look at our views here in templates. You get some templates. That's an excellent HTML comment. What's funny is PayPal is the same thing on theirs. Really? Yes. That's why I wrote that. How much bandwidth do they waste? <laughs> Serving that. So here, this is what it looks like. If, if you're an HTML whiz, you're going to realize that that's not the, that's not exactly bog standard HTML. So that's where the template is actually injecting a variable into the HTML. So it's taking that variable, popping it into the template. That's what makes templates templates, and not just plain old HTML. And body, so that's, that's that's a pretty simple one. Let's go down the border. Go down here, and we can find a couple more. Get an if statement. Cards. So here's where we're doing something interesting. We're treating that as safe. We're turning off those XSS preventions there. That could possibly be a thing. If you're not familiar with XSS, if you didn't make it to the talk, that was just last week, right? Yeah. Talked last week about XSS. Well, right there, we could uh, we could maybe sneak in a script tag in someone's credit card number if we if we can find a way to do that. So now we know what that looks like. Let's see if there's anything else that's flag safe. 
Interesting. Errors are flagged safe. So if we can somehow get an error message to cheese out some HTML on us, we can pull off some XSS. Message. That's interesting. That set is safe. Error message, safe, credit card number. All right, so all these things, they're treated safe. That could be a that could be a major red flag there, because if any of those have HTML on them, then it gets put the web page and we can pull off XSS. So how do those variables get set? What sets those variables? This is the question out to the audience. Give you a hint, it's either the model, the view, or the controller. What sets variables before it kicks it off to the view? <laughs> we'll make you answer if no one else is gonna. Is the I don't know. Answer. I don't know. The controller before it kicks it off to the view. The controller does your logic, sets your variables, and then kicks it off to the view to actually put those values into the HTML. So let's take a look at the controller for that was the account. So we look through here. There we go. So this is that slash account. When something comes in here, it gets the user. Maybe it's some recent transactions. And then renders the account template. So that's interesting. Where is the error or message getting set? Presumably just in some generic error handling routine. We'll see if we can run across that later. Go back to look at some more templates. This looks like it is the main uh, main template. So one thing with templates is you can sort of reuse things. You can have like a, a main one that has some smaller templates inside it. So if you're reusing the same header across the whole website, you can just put them all in there. So this one probably doesn't have anything interesting going on in it. Except I think my about my SSH session. Hug there a little bit. Put it ahead. Got maybe some logic here. Shows this if we got a user. So right here, we're just doing some logic. If you're logged in, we show you a log out button. If you're not logged in, we show you a log in button. So that's what's going on here. Yep. Pretty simple there. Log in. Once again, we're doing that error safe thing. So if we can find a way to get to generate an error message, that maybe what I'm thinking here is if we can give it some garbled input, it might say, hey, here's the garbled input you gave me. This isn't any good in that error message. And if it does that, well, then we just give it HTML, and there's our cross-site scripting. Uh, some interesting hidden forms there. One of, the, one of the neat things you can find in your templates is hidden fields and forms, which is going on right here. Like, or like the... Oh, is that a JavaScript thing that made that button success like thing disabled? Probably. Yeah. yeah. There was there was there was one of them. Um, oh. Oh, maybe that's not this. Oh, that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, hidden fields and forms. That's one of the things. That's actually one of the really neat things you can find buried in views. So for the most part, all your funds and the controllers, which we'll get to before too long. We're we'll just finding out what's going on in our views. Yeah, but if you rely on something to be disabled just because HTML says so, mm -hmm. if you can just like That's edit that with find. my web browser and then yep. click buy the thing. Yeah. Partners. Or item in comments. We're treating the comments as safe. That is a big, big no no. So we just found almost a guaranteed vulnerability there. So we're taking comments that anyone can leave a comment, presumably, and uh, we're treating it as safe. So if their comment has HTML in it, it's screwed. We're putting the HTML on the web page. We're letting users rewrite our website. So that's totally a good idea, right? Anyone who stops by can modify your website, add scripts, add images, redirect people to their own copy of the website. All sorts of bad things. All right, what else we got? Pay. Let's just look for anything else that's safe. So there we're saving something. 
That's interesting because it's uh, going actually into a URL, so we need to treat it as safe because it's going to have some HTML -E like URL things, right? Wrong. You should URL encode stuff to put it there instead of treating it as safe. So these could all be evil. So we'll definitely take a look at the controller for this guy and see how hard it might be to get some evil stuff in there. And then anything else? Once again, it's really just the post back, pay to, all these things are treated as safe. This one looks like it will be a real fun page to hit because we've got a bunch of safe stuff in there. So we'll take a look at the controller first and then we'll hit it. And what else do we have? Register. That one looks real boring. Just that error handling in it anymore. And then security.html. That sounds like a fun one. Let's see if we can hack this page. What people are saying. Look at that. Comments. We're saving them again. So, looks like we could either hit the security.html or we could hit that uh, pay.html. So the first step is we got to figure out what controller does those. And then we need to figure out what, what route goes to that controller. Because when you plug in a URL, it gets routed to a controller. The controller runs some code and then grabs your template. And then the template inserts those variables and ships it off. So, Let's, do, let's start with that pay one. Pay.html. So here is our controller. So this is the slash transaction, it looks like. And then we are setting our variables. So remember that user, that txid, post back, and amount. Those were all safe. But clearly, they're just coming straight out of the form, which is definitely not safe. So if we can just get some garbage form data in there, and then we're set. That gets put right into our template, and then XSS happens. And by XSS happens, what that basically means is you can force feed it some HTML. The template blindly trusts it because we've set it as safe. It, it, it then adds that HTML to the template. And then you can give people scripts that will run, and you can destroy them completely, and it's hilarious, and we laugh at them. Uh, so that's what's going on here. So that other one was security.html. transaction that's got those transaction ID and the post back and those sort of vulnerabilities and then the uh, slash about slash security so taking a look around the web app we know what templates there are and those templates have XSS vulnerabilities in them we know what controllers run those templates and we know what routes we need to hit to get those controllers to get to those templates so let's actually do that Give up it. There we go. Oh yeah, that's a thing. So we just found something, but I'll bring that up at the end. If anyone, if anyone wants to uh, trash this now, go for it. <laughs> Don't trash it too hard during my presentation, but I only need like five more minutes here. So, here's our about page. Looks like I'm already logged in. Yeah, I'm logged in. So we're back here. So it looks like you can leave a comment. Is this, did you do that that way? Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> I've never seen a website do that before. 
so it doesn't look like it works. Well, so that's a dud. So we're gonna, what? It should work. It should work, but it doesn't. So broken functionality protects us from the hackers once more. So now I'm gonna have to do that transaction one, which is way harder. Thanks, Keen. Oh, is it broken? The comment seems to be broken, yeah. No, I think like the web app stopped. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 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 did you yeah, did start it again? Did it start again? No, I, I checked it real fast. So. Yeah, I'm not getting up. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it did. Interesting. It, like, it didn't even crash. It just. Oh, whoops. Uh, oh. <laughs> Do you remember how to change the port on? Yeah, it's in the config file. It's in the main file. The very bottom. You can get your Also, on. why is my bin confused now? Alright, I you just missed my nano. <laughs> <laughs> Never use nano. And control C is even working. Alright. There we go. Hey, look, he's at. XR and R, maybe? Uh, source code. I'm going to say you broke it. I, <laughs> you were the one hacking the site. I typed import OS. Is that supposed to break it? <laughs> huh. I'm going to blame it on the processor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, anyway, so that's a basic crawl through sort of what's in a web application if you've never seen web app source code before. That's what's going on. Uh, is this one up on GitHub yet? Yep, it's on GitHub. Cash Buddy is up on GitHub, so now if you want to crawl through it on your own and look through really, really what makes it tick, there's a, there's a half dozen controllers in it, something like that, that uh, I'll just do little bite-sized chunks of Python code to actually do things before it gets handed off to that template that uh, renders your results. Any questions? Please ask me questions. I feel like I'm just talking to a wall. But you are talking to a wall. <laughs> <laughs> are you walling this <laughs> Is it is it running? Is the web app running? <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the wall. Oh, you get a <laughs> it's the debug console. Yeah, debug up though. Oh, five, it, it came back up on five thousand and five. Oh, it did? So, yeah, it's back up. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> but it's still running. So, what he's messing with is that slash debug route. It's just slash console. It's where, like, yeah, it's fun. 
So, um, oh yeah, because that, that, this will crash it. So a lot of web apps, five, four, oh, yeah. five. a lot of web apps have uh, have a useful debug mode that's really handy. And one of the awesome things about Flask is it has a really useful error here. It tells you it gives you a nice Python trace when something crashes the application, and then you can uh, click over here. And it gives you a Python console. This is a Python console that's literally running inside the web application. So if you do Python in here, that's actually running on the server. So yeah, so you can import cute. OS, and then you can do OS dot system, and then in the parentheses put whatever command you want in quotes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you really want your demo to be over. You know, it's something like that. Uh, what's something hilarious we can do to this? <laughs> Try and throw yourself a reverse shell and then do something. I have one. <laughs> what? <laughs> you do? Ish. Ish. Yeah, you're catting the people's mouths. So, uh, yeah. Flask, we love using it in CDCs because this reverse shell, this debug mode is so totally awesome uh, if you're red team. When you can get it. Uh, so always turn off your web app, and when you're doing a web app on your own, read the documentation. The eternal wisdom of RTFM comes through again because they'll tell you how you should run it in a production environment and how you should definitely, definitely not run it in a production environment. And uh, Debug mode turned on is almost always wrong because stuff like this happens. Um, it crashed again. What? It doesn't like being in debug mode. I think that's, <laughs> that's what I like. This happened the whole CDC when I would try to like hop in this hop in the debug console. Like it would like I'd be able to type a few commands and then it'd like yeah it'd stop like that. So it's still oh it stopped. Uh, it broke my. You broke my console with your walling and stuff. <laughs> That's no. It was it was handling that just fine. I don't know. Kane, were you catting to my no. PTY? No. <laughs> so yeah, web apps. They're really not that intimidating, especially the size ones we give you for the for the CDC. We never really give out these overwhelmingly large web apps. We only keep them nice, bite-sized chunks of code gluing things together. Even in that intimidating behemoth of uh, the ROG store, it was written a lot like this. It's just at the top of each JSP file there was a pile of Java code, and then later it just used a couple of those variables in it. Any questions? No questions? Want me to try to get this up? Yeah? When you were talking about things being safe, is there a reason for something to be safe? If it should have HTML in it, and you know that HTML didn't come from a bad guy, then yes, you can make it safe. So if you're doing, the, the correct answer is if you need to make something safe, you probably made the wrong decision earlier that made you to come to that point. Uh, you might be thinking, oh, well, what if, what if you want people to be able to have bold and H1 and all these things in comments, right? you still shouldn't be storing HTML in your database because it gets a lot harder than if you use something like Markdown. Like, uh, if you use GitHub or Reddit when you're writing comments, you use Markdown. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Have you done it before? What's the website you do use? You don't use the internet? <laughs> Have you ever edited Wikipedia? Uh, not recently. But you, were, you know using like the the weird symbols and everything to do bold and to do headings and links? No. You don't remember that? The important thing is that you never really want to be taking HTML from a user and then giving it back. Because that's the only situation where you need to use safe and you've made terrible decisions if you get to the point where you want to do that. Uh, there are some old school things that work that way and they're all terrible and have millions of vulnerabilities. Um, so yeah, in general, there's there's no reason that you should ever be saving stuff. Yeah. How did you decide um, how to build the flaws in, or like how did you decide 
what to make vulnerable. Oh, in terms of CC, we usually just go for the, the real low hanging fruit. Um, usually access control, that's a lot harder to figure out from looking at an application, but it's gonna be in the controller somewhere. Um, that's usually missing. Uh, in this particular one, there's some real fun stuff if you look at the way passwords are stored. Uh, but that's just some real nuances of how it's actually implemented rather than general. Uh, usually we do XSS because that's easy low hang fruit. You turn off the protection and there you go and all I have to do is fix this turn back on. Um, usually missing access control. What else do we normally go for? A lot of it's just, you know, the OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities, yep. like XSS is one of those. Um, also a lot of flaws in business logic, so you might be able to, you know, modify things that aren't meant to be modified or skip certain processes and the application. Injection. Yeah, injection. Certainly. So The best way to do access control is in your routing, actually. <laughs> most, most of the time, you do it in the controller because it's the easiest way to do it and it works well enough. But where you really want to do it is in your router. So you can say, someone who isn't logged in gets these routes. Someone who is logged in gets these routes plus these. Someone who's logged in as an admin gets these extra routes. Because when you get into really complicated applications, it might not be as simple as return redirect to login unless logged in. It might be allow them to set this flag if they're an admin, otherwise allow them to set these flags, but only if they're removing this flag if they're under. <coughs> and it just gets into a major, major complicated area, but if you break that apart and take care of it in your router, it's a lot easier to make sure you cover all of the shouldn't be able to cases. So then you're saying, and I haven't done a lot of model view controller stuff, like so, like generally when you're using that model for a web app, are you, is it, are you saying that like is whatever's doing your routing, that's what sees the cookie? Or, or does the, or does the model get to see your cookie too? Uh, model controller. For the most part it's going to be your, if, if, if it's a session cookie. Yeah, that like that. It should be handled, so a lot of MVC frameworks have really fancy ways of doing pre and post actions. So generally what you'll want to do is do a pre-action to get their cookie and then get their user model. Okay. And then use your, uh, in your controllers, look at the user model instead of looking directly at the cookie. Oh yeah, because the model, yeah, usually the framework's gonna just do all that crap for you. Yeah. Okay. So in this case, there actually was an attempt at that. I know, how, I, I do know for a fact that it is botched. Um, Mostly. Well, somewhat. It, it somewhat. works enough to make you think that it works, but it actually doesn't. It works too well, I guess you could say. Yeah. So this this uh, get user thing that we got going on is happening before most of these controllers, which is basically a, a, a weird way using some real nifty features of Python that most people don't know about to run this function before we run the other function. And this get user function basically does some business logic there to get your user and get your user model. That then happens before almost every round. And I don't know, particularly with Flask, if, uh, if well, uh, you could use the same thing to do a, like a requires login for that right up there, because it's sort of inline routing anyway, it doesn't really make that much sense to break off your routing and do it separately uh, than doing it in your controllers, but yeah. So there's there's a lot of interesting features in most web app things that, uh, that let you do pre and post actions, and Rails they're called filters. Uh, in Flask you can just do it with Python closures like that, decorators I think they're called. But in general, you want to only mess with the cookie in one place, and then just use that to pull out a model. And then all of your controllers look at the model to make decisions. Any other questions? Source code's up on GitHub. Uh, someone will post that in the ISG. I can do that. Yeah, cool. Were you raising your hand, or? All right. Well, that's
that, uh, that about concludes the web app teardown. Any general club stuff you want to talk about? I think we're good. Uh, beginner's night, 10-12, probably 6.30. Is this sequel? No. <laughs> <laughs>